Welcome to Skippable News, where you can skip to the part you want by going to the menu in the description below or the progress bar. Haven't figured it out by now? Watching on television or satellite? However you're getting it, welcome to non-skippable news. I'm Jason Brown. I'm Jimmy T. Welcome back. Yes. Where have you been? I had COVID. Tell us about it. Next week. Here's this week's stories. We had Brad Dacus in. We uh, noticed the price of beef is going up, so we had Tom Nolan in on the business of chasing cows. We have a new segment from Chris Langley, Eye on the Artist of Inyo County, with Frank Serrano. We had Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association's Jeff Gabriel and Jenna in. And we have the weather, the fly fishing report, the bass report, the butt hurt comment of the week, and the pick of the week. So, Jimmy. Today we're going to talk about the business of chasing cows. Mr. Tom Nolan came up from the world famous Anchor Ranch to tell us about it. I get to ride, I get to chase cows, no big decisions. I don't have to decide, oh, we got to be here, we got to be there. So that's game. Where are we going to get the help? Where, you know, yeah. when are the trucks coming? And, right. Well, I, I, I'm kind of curious about the business side. You know, watching Yellowstone, of course, I know all about oh, chasing yeah. cows and all that stuff. But I'm sort of uh, interested in how it is to run a small ranch. My impression, probably mis a misnomer in some ways, but my impression is that ranches are big, huge operations, big business, and, and certainly yours is a small family ranch. Right, a, ran a ranch could be anything from the guy with five cows to the guy with 5,000 cows. And, and, you know, some of the most successful ranches, they don't have to be big. But say the guy and his wife have a job in town. Well, that's that's the best way for the economics of it to work. <clears throat> but then you get to a certain size and you have to be on the ranch full time. And so somebody has to be on the ranch full time. And a certain situation, uh, I mean, if a guy was uh, knocking down a big wage in town, he's a banker, a lawyer, whatever. He, he can afford to hire good guys to work for him. And that's the way a lot of ranches work. But on our ranch, it's always been somebody in the family that's been the manager and then probably a hired guy also. So there's just usually two guys on our ranch full time. And then the rest of us are helping out depending on what the workload is, mainly helping out like with the, the working of the cattle, moving cattle. That's when you need a lot more people, and so. You, I know you get volunteers too. Yeah, and then our our friends. Oh, I mean, we have friends that'll come up from Southern California. They got horses, and and they just love it. Come up and ride and chase cows. Yeah. And uh, you know, really do us a service, and it you know it costs them money to come up here, fuel and everything, and and um, they just eat it up. Let, let, what are some of the big challenges a small ranch, family ranch like you have, are facing today? Is it any different than 20 or 40 years ago? Or, I well, mean, well, obviously the <clears throat> world is different. But. Right. Well, one thing that's, that's happened, the price of cattle is way better than it ever used to be. Now, why is that? People eating more beef? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And, I mean, there's way more people in the world. So there's more people eating beef. And, and, and lucky for us, the price has gone up that we can receive for our cattle. Uh, years ago, and I, I didn't expect that. I, I, everything seems to, you know, that's from a long time ago, seems to not quite turn the profit that it used to. So that's good to hear. Of course, all the inputs are way more expensive. You know, fuel, taxes, everything is way more expensive. So. If these cattle weren't at the price that they are today, nobody would be raising cattle. It, it wouldn't be good. So, yeah, you know, looking back at the, well, the, the late 50s and 60s especially, we would, we would borrow money every year. We had an operating loan, which is a standard practice in agriculture. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of outfits, whether you're farming, cattle or whatever, you have an operating loan. But come the end of the year, we'd sell our calves, and that's, you know, when you make your money, and uh, we'd go to pay back our operating loan. We didn't even have enough money to pay back the operating loan. We had to buy money 
or borrow money to pay back the operating loan. So that was, we got in a downhill spiral back then. Mm. And uh, since then, we, we've been fortunate enough. You're working on, a, on a, a balance sheet every year. You got a budget and, uh, you know, we were borrowing money, but we were paying it back. And we got to the stage after a while that we were able to just operate on our own money and not borrow anything from the bank anymore. And that was a real good feeling. Yeah, I bet. So we can make decisions I wasn't now. expecting that, actually. Yeah. Okay, That's yeah. That's good news. No, so. that's we've been we've been solvent for quite a few years like that, and uh, it, you know you you can make decisions based on well, do we really want to buy this new tractor? You know, what do we want to do this way or that way with without having the bank over you? And well, can we pay this money back to the bank? And so little by little, we've we've gotten ahead that way. I I know how you get Kev. What a great guy. And now we're going to talk an eye on the art, artists of Inyo County. Chris Langley interviews Frank Serrano. This guy is an amazing artist. The pictures are lifelike and they're real people and they're real locations in Inyo County. Apologize about the low light, the noise, but it's still a good interview. Morning, I'm Chris Langley and this is Eye on Inyo Artists and today we have uh, who I think is one of the best artists of our area and maybe any area, Frank Serrano. And we're going to be talking about his work and how he got to uh, Inyo County and also um, what he sees here. Um, he's, I, I think he would be prolific probably, right? It seems I, like you I do a, a lot. lot of work. I do. Yeah. yeah. And um, we're going to talk about how he captures uh, the lighting here, which he's a, a pro at, and so other people have noticed that too, so we'll get to that. Morning. Morning, Chris. It's early, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not as early as it was yeah, going to be. Yeah, it's been kind of chilly. Yeah, kinda chilly and definitely morning. chilly. Yeah. How's that go with painting? Uh, uh, not it, so good outside. The, is the oil get kind of... It, it, hard, the... it, it hardens up a little bit, you know, but for the most part, it, it, it can be dealt with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Frank, I've known you for s several years now, actually. Yeah. Time flies by. But how did you get here to begin with, and why are you here now, sort of? Well, my career started many, many years ago. Um, I lived in, uh, more recently, I had lived in the Glendale area, which is uh, close to Pasadena, which is uh, where the California Art Club is. And I, I've been a long-standing member of the California Art Club. And uh, many great artists from the past, uh, Edgar Payne, who used to come up here to the mm -hmm. Sierras. Uh, all of them were members of the California Art Club. And when I was younger, I used to come up here with my dad fishing. So it was, I kind of put two and two together and I knew eventually that I would want to come up here and possibly live up here. So uh, about six years ago, I made the, made the move and came up. And, and before that, or I guess maybe still, you paint also seascapes as well. Yeah, well, I started, I started with the seascapes. Um, I was um, not really painting outdoors yet. I was in the studio doing a lot of stuff, and I met a friend of mine who wanted to jump in his van and, and go paint the coast, so we started doing that. And uh, I lived near the coast, so it was kind of an easy, easy, easy thing to do, is just uh, grab your paint box and, and go to the coast and start painting. So that's what we did, and that's how I got into the, you know, actually the plein air painting outdoors. Yeah, let's talk about plein air because I don't know how many people have heard that term. Uh, it's getting more and more common. well yeah. well known and yeah, common, it but is. it's basically uh, Monet and the French impressionists coined that term because they used to go out and paint um, on location, and that's how it all started. And then there was a and it's I, a French word, I think. It's a French word, en, en plein air. Yeah, it means out out in the open or outside. And um, so I started going out with my friend Brent, and then I uh, hooked up uh, with some other friends who were members of the California Art Club. And so I went uh, with them t to uh, uh, some events, and then I, eventually I joined the club. And that's how that all began. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what have you found about the locations here, or what are the challenges <laughs> of working here? Oh, well, this place is fabulous. I just love it. I love the valley. The Owens Valley is probably my favorite. I love painting up in the Sierras. 
but it's a little bit more difficult to, you know, uh, trek up the, you know, unless you're packing uh, to go up and, and paint there all the time. And uh, so the, the Owens Valley is so vast, the Inyo Mountains, um, the White Mountains, I, I just love the, some of the views that I can get with those mountains. They and seem different to me also. They are. And there's a diversity of Yeah, and the coloration, looks. everything yeah. is, is different. Uh, I like the high desert feel, and um, I can get really uh, the best of both worlds living right here in the valley, you know, the Sierras and then the, the Inyo Mountains. So it's great. And then a lot of painters from the past uh, have been through here. Maynard Dixon especially, mm -hmm. very famous Western painter. Uh, he lived in Lone Pine. Actually. He had friends in Lone Pine. He didn't. I don't think he lived there. He stayed with them for a while. Yeah, that's in, what I like mean. Like around 1919, something yeah, like that. Yeah, about like almost a year, but not quite. And his wife, uh, Dorothy Lang, was here with, and she was taking care of the kids. And she, this is a story I've been told that she was frustrated because he was out doing his art thing, and she wanted to be out doing her photography. Oh thing. yeah, and she was. And they finally a, got the kids into a private school or something and yeah yeah and, and she was such a great photographer yeah I and mean, some of her most famous photographs of the depression and things like that frank is great if you had a chance to look at his art or come back next week and you learn more eastern sierra interpretive association came in about their winter adventure series jeff and jen are going to talk about that right now hello i'm jeff gabriel with the eastern sierra interpretive association and I have here today a special guest, uh, Jenna Wood, who is our Education Manager for the Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association. And we're going to be talking about some events that we have coming up, and in particular, the Adventure Series. So we have one that we had last week on January 20th. We have one coming up January 27th. So who do we have coming up for January 27th? All right, so... Uh, this Thursday, January 27th, we've got Ryan Navales, and Ryan Navales is the president of Inyo County Search and Rescue, and he's also an ultra runner around here, um, but he has kind of an unusual story where he found running. Um, he was actually homeless living in Skid Row, um, and an L.A. court su superior judge started a running club where he got homeless people actually out running. And so Ryan found running and now has done over, um, I mean, countless marathons on five different continents. And so he's really turned his life around through running, uh, calls Bishop home and loves running. He found recovery through it. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm excited for that. Yeah. So what uh, details? Uh, how do people register? What time do they need to be there? Where is it actually going to be held? And Yeah. So if you want to come here, Ryan's inspirational story. Uh, come out to the Mammoth Lakes Welcome Center. It's in the U.S. Forest Service Auditorium. Show starts at 7 p.m., but doors open at 6. And this event, uh, you can find more information by Googling the Winter Adventure Series, finding us on Facebook, Instagram, just look Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association. And uh, yeah, you can register there. Okay, great. Um, and so do we have any special sponsors for the upcoming January 27th event? Yeah, so like always, it's sponsored by the Town of Mammoth Lakes, Mammoth Lakes Recreation, Measure U Funding, and this event will also be sponsored by June Lake Brewing. So with your admission, if you're over 21, you can get beer from June Lake Brewing, and uh, if you're under 18, free admission. Otherwise, it's $15 admission. Great. All right. So um, we have uh, then January 27th, doors opening at 6, presentation at 7. That's right. Yeah, come on out. We'd love to see you there. Great. Thank you. Again, Jeff Gabriel with the Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association with my special guest, guest Jenna Wood. Um, and we are excited to have you join us Thursday evening, January 27th. Wow, thanks. Go to Mammoth. Check it out. So, what's happening now? Oh, we had Brad Dacus in here while I was gone. I think you and uh, Bill did an interview with him, and it's controversial. I don't think the interview so much is, but the, the name Brad Dacus is in the valley. Uh, hey, if you got factual information of a counterpoint on anything that he has to say, we'd love to have you in the studio. We're just presenting you with the information. It's your job to make up your mind on anything related to anything. Uh, send your email to news at laughing-parrot.com. We'll review it, get back to you, 
And if it's factual, we'd love to have you in the station here um, giving your viewpoint. Anyway, let's go to Brad. So I'm happy to have Brad Dacus with me. He's the founder and president of the Pacific Justice Institute. And for some of you, you may not know who that is. Some of you may think you know what that is. Let's get it right from Brad himself. First off, Brad, welcome to have you here. And who are you? <laughs> uh, well, basic, easy question. Yes, uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, I graduated from the University of Texas School of Law, put myself through law school, put myself through undergrad at Texas A&M with a degree in finance. Uh, and then in 1997, I founded the Pacific Justice Institute. Five years prior to that, I uh, coordinated an office for the Rutherford Institute and I opened an office for them on the West Coast, coordinating litigation in 14 Western states, defending religious freedom, parental rights, the sanctity of human life, uh, all without charge. And uh, then in 1997, uh, Rutherford contracted, and instead of going back east, uh, I decided to continue doing the work, so I opened the Pacific Justice Institute. And uh, fast forward, we now have uh, 20 offices in 16 states, coast to coast, from Miami to Boston to Seattle to Orange County and many places in between. Uh, we have a, a large affiliate a network of attorneys. Uh, we do our work without charge. Uh, we are a true uh, civil liberties organization. We actually put our clients first. We don't use our clients. Uh, we uh, are also people who don't just cherry pick high profile cases. Uh, we work hard to make sure that everyone gets help, that no one's left on the side of the road. And uh, if it fits under our category of religious freedom, parental rights, the sanctity of life, uh, then uh, and they have a viable case, so we take it on. Uh, that's what we do. And uh, we've been doing that since 1997. I also have a radio show program called The Dacus Report. It's heard on 730 stations and transmitters across the country. And almost all of that is just donated airtime uh, because we're serving so many communities uh, so dynamically that these stations want us on. So we're on the air, and then we also have a Zoom calls every other week uh, to empower people. Uh, we have a commentary, the, the, the Legal Edge. It's Monday through Friday. It's on over 800 stations and transmitters. And uh, we're working really hard just to make sure that everyone knows their rights, knows their freedoms. And we work uh, hard to make sure that everyone gets that protection, uh, irrespective of, uh, of what, what group or what, what their beliefs may be, we make sure everyone gets protection and make sure their rights are protected. Something really important I want to point out right from the get-go is this. Unless you have religious freedom for everyone, you have religious freedom for no one. Uh, unless we have uh, parental rights for everyone, we have parental rights for no one. Uh, same with the sanctity of human life. So we make sure, we operate based on principle not based on what group we might be affiliated with or a part of, um, or what agenda we have. We're about principles, and those principles are all supported by the Constitution of the United States. So we are big, big fans of the Constitution. Uh, we really respect the Constitution of the United States. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. And I think you just answered my next question for me. Now, as I was doing research, I did what a lot of people have done. I went to Wikipedia and I looked up you and I looked up the Pacific Justice Institute. First line, the Pacific Justice Institute is a hate group, blah, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So says the Southern Justice Law Center. Or Southern Poverty Law Center. Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm sorry. Yes. Dude. Yes. Uh, well, no, we're, well, we're not a hate group. Let me make that very clear. Um, let me give you some examples because people can say all the time that they are hate, you know, they're a hate group or not a hate group. I say, take a look at what they do. What are their actions? Uh, let me give you some examples that display that we're an organization of principle. Uh, we're not an organization of, of grouping uh, or, or, or prejudice in that regard. Uh, specifically, let's talk about parental rights. One thing that we do is we give emergency counsel to parents who have social workers, CPS, threatening to take their kids for unjustifiable reasons. Most of the children are taken are, should not be taken. That's a, a report done by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, in, the, in the Obama administration. So 
there's a lot of abuse taking place, a lot of parents losing their kids. We're the only organization on a nationwide scale that gives emergency counsel to help kids from being wrongfully taken. Hey, if parents are abusive, then our advice isn't going to work for them. Having them take the child to a private pediatrician, private child psychologist, have assessments, it's, it's all going to come to the surface. And if they're abusive, it's going to come to the surface. But most of the time, they're not. Well, one day I got a call from a, a couple. Actually, it was a woman. She called me and, uh, and she has a, a same-sex partner. Uh, I believe they're married under California law at the time. And uh, she told me that her daughter uh, that uh, is, is being threatened by social workers, that they're wanting to interrogate the family. They may take that daughter away from her. Now, mind you, once again, I said, this is a same-sex couple. I knew that right from the beginning of the phone call. I didn't flinch. Why? Because we're about principle. And this is about a mother. This is her daughter. And I don't know if the other partner had adopted the daughter or not. I'm not I don't remember that. But anyway, at any rate, this is their family. And the government was going to wrongfully take their, their child. Uh, they, this mother in particular, she has, and the other part, of, if, as, as she also assumed the, uh, the adoption or uh, parenthood, they have rights as parents. Um, and those rights must be respected. Um, do, I, do I come from that philosophy? Is that a part of my ideology? No, it's outside of my, my, my own personal re religious beliefs and convictions as far as that goes. I don't, I don't apologize for it. But, but the bigger issue is do they have rights that are being violated? And the answer is yes. And I spent a long time on the phone giving them the counsel that they needed to protect their family from government overreach and possibly uh, taking wrongfully taking a child. That's just one example. Any comments? No comments for me. No comments for me. Uh, <laughs> weather. Mid-60s during the day, mid-20s in the night. Clear for the next 10 days. It's beautiful. It's great. Don't come here. That's right. Stay and away. Uh, <laughs> if, if you don't believe me, go to your phone, Alexa, wherever. Yeah, it's going to be really nice next 10 days, that's for sure. Hey, we had uh, Fred Rowe and Kurt Hendricks in. One does the fly fishing report. The other one does the bass slash trout report from a spinning cast. Let's go to those. Hello, I'm Fred Rowe from Sierra Bright Dot Fly Fishing Guide Service. I've been teaching, guiding, writing, and lecturing in the Eastern Sierras since 1982. Weather in the winter time is the biggest factor to how we're doing fishing. With a couple weeks of sunny weather, we're starting to see midges hatch. And that's really helped out the fly fishing up at Hawk Creek. Middle of the day, 11 to 1-ish, the fish are coming up to the surface and taking midge patterns. A great pattern when the midges are on the surface is a Griffith snap in a size 20. Over on um, the upper Owens, we're doing really good up there for trophy trout. Those fish are in the bigger, deeper holes or deeper runs, and we're catching them on bigger flies, size 12 stoner nymphs, um, prince nymphs with the green gold body, and then with gold ribbed hairs there. Um, you access up there, you have to ski with cross-country skis, snowshoe, snowmobile, or walk-in. The snow's been packed enough that you can now walk up there to fish. And over the three-day weekend, it definitely got a lot of fishing pressure. Down here in the Owens Valley, the lower Owens has been getting a lot of pressure and fishing really good. Middle of the day, we're seeing a few insects coming off. The bulk of the fishing is nymphing. And I'm doing really good with all of Quildagons and Prince Nymphs and pheasant tails, and then we're also using the midges, tiger midges, zebra midges, blood midges. Over on Bishop Creek Canal, behind the Ford dealer, really fun fishing, and no more dry fly action, but nymphing, and we're using the same midge patterns, tiger midges, zebra midges, and blood midges, and then occasionally they're hitting the uh, mayfly imitation of the Quildagon or the beaded flashback pheasant tail. And I'm Fred Rowe from Sarah Bright Dot Fly Fishing Guide Service, and I can be found on Facebook or Instagram. What is going on, Eastern Sierra? It is Inyo Kurt. You can find me on Instagram at Inyo Kurt. Here to talk about fishing in the winter. 
Uh, we're going to start with bass fishing. Right now is an incredibly tough time to fish for bass, um, but you can still catch them. A lot of people don't even fish, fish bass all winter. They don't, don't even try because it can get so hard. Um, and I'm here to kind of bust a few myths. Uh, number one being you can't catch bass in the winter. Uh, that is not true. You can catch bass in the dead of winter when it's freezing cold. You just have to know how. How you might do that is um, approach it a little bit differently. You want a slow retrieve. You want a slow falling presentation. Um, with a slow retrieve, you can get a slower retrieving reel or you could reel it really slow, either or. That's going to be integral when it comes to catching them. Uh, another thing, downsize your baits. Bass aren't going to chase those giant swim baits, those giant worms, giant jigs. You're not going to go after them. Downsize. Now, if you catch a weird break and you notice bass are oddly feeding on random stuff they wouldn't normally feed on in the winter, adjust accordingly. Maybe they might hit that swim bait. Just pay attention. Um, another thing I noticed just while out fishing, I went fishing for some trout this week and uh, did pretty well on some Rapalas uh, out deep. So, uh, you know, wintertime can also be fun for trout fishing. Uh, there's plenty of good areas to do that around here. And, um, you know, you can still have a lot of fun fishing bass. You can still have a lot of fun fishing trout. Do not let the winter discourage you from going out there and uh, becoming the best angler you can be. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Kurt Hendricks, Instagram in yo Kurt. Have a good day. Excellent. All right. One of my Sorry. favorites. Welcome back, Kurt. Oh, yes. Welcome Sorry. back, Kurt. Can do that again? No, that's good. Okay. Welcome uh, back, Kurt. Butthurt comment of the week. Uh, it's from James. I used to be butthurt about the quality of pizza in the area. I found the champ. Hands down, Flo's is cranking out what I think is the best pizza I've had in this valley. James, I want to put you to the test here. I want four other people. Just go to news at laughing-parrot.com if you want to be on this panel. We are going to do a blind taste challenge. We want to get Flo's, Upper Crust, Pizza Factory, two brothers from Italy down in Big Pine, and anybody else that you can think of, and we want to find out who really does. But have. should there be some requirements for the taste testers? Well, I think they shouldn't have had COVID. they got to be able to taste the pizza. <laughs> Put in why you think that you should be a taste tester, and we'll review them, and we'll get back to you. Hey, uh, before we go to the pick of the week. Before we go to the pick of the week, what happened 32 years ago and celebrated two years ago? Tremors. <gasps> and then they had the Tremors 30th anniversary, and it became a huge cult following in this movie. And there's Facebook pages or groups dedicated to it. I mean, it's an incredible group of people, and they came from all over the world, guys, to come to this event that was two years ago at the Lone Pine Film Museum, and it was epic. We had Michael Gross, Ron Underwood, Robert Jane, uh, Charlotte, uh, and we got to show the, uh, the, the original movie on Blu-ray in the theater, and Charlotte was up in the front repeating lines. I remember Michael and Ron and all of them kind of having to sit off on the side because there weren't chairs, but they didn't complain. They were troopers and they loved it. They were just joyous to be able to watch it with the fans. And they said it was like watching it for the first time. The video that you see playing behind us is uh, Laughing Parrot Productions on location with Chris Langley Trimmers Edition. We showed this two years ago at the event. We would really like it if you went over there and checked it out. We think you would enjoy it if you were a Trimmers fan. Who is the best character, Bert, or are you wrong? <laughs> Love it. Anyway, this is the pick of the week. Pick of the week was taken by Chris Langley. Yes, I know. Chris, 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 Chris. But anyway, if you don't want to see Chris's stuff anymore, send your own pictures to us. Put in the subject, picture of the week and send it to news at laughing-parrot.com. We'd love to feature your picture next week as picture of the week. Thanks for watching this episode of Skippable News. We look forward to seeing you next week. And oh my God, it's great to be back. Welcome back. See you next week. Winter Adventures. Yeah. Okay. It, take it away. Want yeah. to do that again? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> now that you talked over it so much. So we're coming back from Frank. Ready?